Do, do. Okay, we are rolling. Three, two, one. And hello, everyone. Joining us now is Dr. Corey DeAngela, Senior Fellow at the American Federation for Children and a visiting fellow at Stanford University, but also called the School Choice Evangelist. I've been following you for quite some time. I met you about a year ago. It's an honor to see you here, sir. Hey, thanks for having me, Dave. Absolutely. Now, I want to get to it right away. You have a book uh, that is basically coming out soon or is out called The Parent Revolution. And this book is gripping the nation. I've seen people tweeting about it even before they can get their hands on it. Talk about the book a little bit. Yeah, a lot of people saying, oh, we can't read this. It's it's just a bunch of garbage. Well, you haven't read it yet. And we also had a teachers union board member in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, call to burn the book. They said, oh, it's a great day for a book burning party. The same radical leftist yahoos that are complaining about conservatives banning books by taking sexually explicit content out of public school libraries. They're the same people calling to burn my book that they've never read, a book that's for adults. I mean, it just goes to show you they're, they're big time hypocrites. A lot of them send their own kids to private school, but the hypocrisy also has moved on to the book banning slash burning debate. If they if the teachers union radicals are upset about the book already and they want to burn it, that probably tells you it's a good idea that you should probably read it. It's called The Parent Revolution, Rescuing Your Kids from the Radicals Ruining Our Schools. And look, the backlash on social media right now just goes to show you that the radicals that are uh, mentioned in the subtitle are really upset that you're going to uh, be able to have a say in your children's education. They want to be the ones to direct your children's uh, uh, upbringing. They want to control the minds of other people's children. And that's why we've seen a, a parent revolution sparking over the past few years. The teachers unions overplayed their hand when they fought to keep the schools closed. They they won out in the short term in that they got a lot of money. They were able to leverage the school closures for more funding. They were able to extort more money from the taxpayers because they said, hey, we're not open because we need more money. Of course, that's the reason why we're not open. Yeah. Uh, but that plan backfired really quickly through the remote learning, which we really should have just called remotely learning because yeah. not a lot of learning was going on. Yeah. Families got to see a lot of the BS that was happening in the classroom. The school's curriculum was not aligned with the family's values. You had Marxist curriculum. You have gender ideology at a very young age sexualized topics in the schools and parents are pissed off about it. They started to push back at the school board meetings. The school boards weren't happy about it. They even tried to cut off the mics of a lot of parents. They've also sent a letter to the department of justice, implying that some parents should be labeled as domestic terrorists for pushing back at school board meetings. It just really goes to show you that when you threaten the powers that be, they'll try to bully and silence you into submission Thankfully, their plan backfired there as well. It only emboldened families to push back even harder to stick up and fight for the right to educate their own children as they see fit. And since then, since that letter uh, actually went out, there have been 26 states that have pulled their funding or their membership from the National School Boards Association. Wow. We might as well call them the Regional School Boards Association at this point because Look, you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. Um, they're winning the stupid prizes right now with a, a max ex exodus from the public school system as well. Absolutely. And if you would like to purchase the book, I have a link, uh, whatever platform you're watching on, just link in the comments or in the post and you can click right there and you can purchase. One question, Where I'm 49 years old. I don't remember this back in school. And I went to a Catholic school from K to eight, but then I went to a public school where did this start to go wrong? Where did it start to go off the rails? A lot of people ask me, where did it, you know, can you pin it down to an area where it got so, as your book, you know, radical? I mean, I think they've controlled the government school system longer than we realize. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason that we don't realize is because a lot of families thought things were okay. It's not just that just in 2020, everything became crazy and the school started to become you know, yeah. breeding grounds for socialists to to go out into the rest of society. I think it had already been happening and we can't pinpoint exactly when it started. But if you look at the teachers colleges, that the colleges of education, where a lot of the educators are trained that go into the K to 12 education system, they teach a lot of radical Marxist ideology 
when they're trained to become teachers. And then they bring that to the K through 12 level. And I think some people also just see the school system as a way to raise other people's children. They don't really, they're not really excited about math reading and writing. They're more excited about their political agenda, things that they talk about with their friends on the weekends. And then they bring that kind those concepts into the classroom with them because it's more enjoyable for them to, to talk about their radical socialist projects as opposed to doing the real hard stuff of actually teaching kids how to read and teaching them how to do uh, math problems. It's easier to, to indoctrinate kids uh, with your own ideology that you talk about on the weekends than it is to actually teach them to pass a, a test, whether it comes to, to math reading or writing. Yeah. And so like to, to get to it, it, that's not a specific answer, I know. But my point is that with COVID, it kind of lifted up the curtain of things that were already happening. I think that's just sunlight is the best disinfectant. Now we have viral videos going. I mean, basically we have cameras in all the classrooms. They're called cell phones. Kids can record what's going on. And then libs of TikTok accounts like mine can share the rot that's infiltrated the school system. And look at the end of the day, even with, um, a school system that's well-intentioned, you're going to have someone that has a problem with it for the, for the, the basic fact is that we have a one size fits all government school system that you're assigned to based on your address. And the reality is parents disagree about how they want to raise their kids. Mm -hmm. And no matter what type of curriculum, no matter how you teach it, families are going to end up upset about it. Uh, if there's any type of hint of political ideology, especially that that uh, infiltrates its way into the classroom, parents are going to push back. And the only solution to the one size fits all problem is from the bottom up, allowing families to vote with their feet to schools that are aligned with their values. One school, a public school might be the best fit for a lot of kids, even the majority of the kids in the area. But that doesn't mean it's going to be the right match. For a family that wants their kids to have a religious education, that wants a specialized mission in the private sector, or maybe there's a peer group that uh, it, it's not bullying their child in, in the private school sector. There's a lot of different reasons why parents will choose schools. Academics are part of it. Uh, curriculum's part of it. Safety is a big part of the equation as well. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The first things parent want, a parent wants is their child to be in a safe environment. And then you obviously can't learn a whole lot if you're not in a, a safe environment. And so that's why school choice is so important as well to, uh, to, to allow families to, to sort into institutions that are aligned with their values. But also there's a competitive response too. If the public schools know you can vote with your feet, they're probably not going to cut off your mic anymore. They're probably not going to label you as a domestic terrorist. They'll see you as a customer, listen to you, and focus on the basics because they don't want to alienate any of their customers on the right or the left. And so it's in their best interest in a competitive market to focus on math, reading, and writing. And there's certain states doing that right, I believe, Florida, but here in Michigan, I'm in Michigan, and I don't think they get it. Grand Rapids School District, and the headlines, they're closing schools left and right. The population of the district is declining. More and more parents are either homeschooling or charter schooling. Um, just the other day, the Michigan Board of Education uh, ur urging lawmakers to uh, limit the amount of charter schools. When are the lawmakers, for example, in Michigan or the people in charge of the schools gonna, are going to realize because parents are pulling their kids left and right in this state. At some point, they have to realize, hey, it's not working what we're doing. They start to realize once it hits them at the ballot box. And so this wasn't the case in Michigan. It went blue, obviously, but that was the kind of the exception as opposed to the rule where in 2022, yes, there was talk about a red wave and, and then, you know, nationwide that didn't really happen a blue wave didn't happen nationwide either but nationwide there was a school choice wave 76 percent of the candidates supported by my organization the american federation for children and our state affiliates won their races in 2022 nice. and we didn't just play in the easy ones we targeted 69 incumbents in state legislatures that's the hardest thing to do in politics and we took out 40 of them that is basically wow. impossible wow. given the track record of incumbents winning their reelection about 95% of the time. 
that trend has been inverted in recent years, especially in states like Texas, where I live. I'm in Arizona right now, the land of education freedom. They passed universal school choice in 2022. But in Texas, uh, we targeted 13 of the incumbents on the Republican side who voted against school choice in the primaries. And we took out or sent into runoffs, 10 of them, translating to a 77% win rate for school choice supporters against anti-school choice incumbents who voted against their own party platform issue of school choice. So the Republican Party in a lot of states is becoming, you know, picking up the mantle as the parents party. And if they're not in places like the Texas House, the Republican Party primary voters are holding them to that moniker, whether they like it or not. We saw this in Iowa, too. After their school choice bills uh, passed the Senate very easily in 2022 as a bill championed by Governor Reynolds, a true education freedom fighter in Iowa, it didn't pass the Republican-controlled House in uh, 2022. Well, then in the primaries, the uh, primary voters were not uh, happy about it. So they got a new House, much more conservative, that supported school choice, and they got full-throated school choice across the finish line in 2023. The running joke in Iowa is that the Democrats should have voted for the pared down, very limited version of school choice in 2022 that ultimately didn't pass because what happened when the new house came in was they got a full blown, everybody's eligible universal school choice initiative that passed in 2023. This is happening in Texas right now where the house blocked it. The elections went the way of the school choice supporters. And now in 2025, we're betting that there's going to be an even more expansive bill on the table than was even considered in 2023. So the political winds in general are shifting towards education freedom. We yeah. saw this uh, no better of an example than in Virginia with Glenn Youngkin, yep. the Republican who beat Terry McAuliffe, the former governor of, of uh, Virginia, on the issue of education freedom, where in the last debate, Uh, Terry McAuliffe, the Democrat in a state that went 10 points to Biden the year before, said, I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. The the families weren't happy about that. He even had Randy Weingarten, the school closer, (laughs) stumping for him the night before the election. The school closer was his campaign closer. And a Virginia mom even went on left wing CNN and said uh, that was the nail in the coffin moment for her when he had Randy Weingarten stumping for him, the union boss. Uh, for the election. Basically, her endorsement had become the political kiss of death uh, in some instances for for candidates who who were supportive of her closure of, of the school systems. So in Michigan, look, the Republicans, when they had the majority, did have the votes. They passed uh, through both chambers a, a very expansive private school choice initiative that was funded through a tax credit Uh, But then Governor Whitmer, who also was supportive of closing schools in Michigan, vetoed the bill. We came very close to sending that bill past to the next back to the legislature after getting enough signatures, um, uh, but didn't get didn't come far enough to being able to do so. So Michigan was one of the states where uh, we came very close, but it um, it it wasn't it it didn't go across the finish line. And if it did. once you can pass school choice, the Democrats know this, is that they will have to be more likely to to support parents in the future and not just the teachers unions because a new political constituent co- constituency builds. And this happened in Florida. I mean, you mentioned that Florida already has education freedom. But in, yeah. in 2018, you wouldn't know this because in 2022, DeSantis won by about 20 points. But in 2018, there was a Wall Street Journal article uh, with the headline, school choice moms tipped the governor's race for DeSantis. He barely won by a fraction of a percentage point in 2018. He was running against Andrew Gillum, a Democrat who did not support their private school choice initiative. And uh, there was already about 100,000 families benefiting from the program at that time. Well, um, if you look at the exit polling, black moms uh, came out in support for DeSantis much high at a much higher rate than expected. And so uh, the story there is the families that were using the school choice initiative were disproportionately non-white, were disproportionately low income, and those families were more likely to vote for DeSantis than expected. 
And so you can basically create single issue voters on the issue of education freedom. If, if you would have usually voted Democrat, but you think that person's going to get rid of your uh, lifeline for your child to not be in a dangerous environment and for them to actually succeed in life and go to a better educational institution, you're going to make that your priority. And I think that's caused some political winds to shift in Florida too, with when they went universal in 2023 yeah. last year, 10, uh, 11% of the Democrats in the Florida House voted for the universal school choice bill. Fast Ooh. forward to this year in 2024, Louisiana's House passed school choice in a universal way for everybody, but easily by a vote of 72 to 32, 20% of their Democrats in Louisiana House voted for the universal full-throated school choice bill this year too. There are other examples from Nebraska, Missouri. Yeah. Um, some Democrat legislators in, in places like North Carolina and Georgia actually changed to the Republican Party <laughs> on the issue of school choice. So when are things going to change in Michigan? Well, um, it's when it's when voters actually hold, make this a priority, hold them accountable, uh, politicians accountable for stomping on their rights as parents to direct the upbringing of their children. Gotcha. And that's one reason why I worked in the mainstream media for 25 years. The information was not getting out there about both sides. So that's why I'm big. I, I follow you. I share your information. And sometimes people will challenge me. Well, I don't want my money going to a Catholic school or a private school. I always refer them to your content. And then many times they don't have anything to say because, and my thing is, why would you not want to give <clears throat> the children, the choice or the parents, the choice. And the other side really usually doesn't, this will be my last question. They don't have an answer. So I think in this state at least, and that's why I'm doing this, it's about educating people who really don't know. Yeah, the money doesn't belong to the government schools. The education funding is meant for educating children, yes. not for propping up and protecting a particular institution. You, you, you don't have to take it to the private school either. The money should follow the child to wherever they want to get an education. And that's the public school. That option's still on the table. And in fact, with school choice initiatives, time and time again, 26 to 29 studies find positive effects of private school choice competition on the outcomes in the public schools. Yeah. And so, look, if you don't want to send your kid to the Catholic school, fine. You can still take your kid's allocated tax dollars and send all of that to the public school. But if not, if anything, with a school choice initiative, you're only getting about half of the total amount. In the U.S., on average, we spend about $20,000 per student per year in the U.S., according to the latest uh, federal data from the National Center for Education Statistics. Wow. On average, private school tuition is only about twelve or 13000 Some are higher, obviously. Some are lower. Yeah. But with school choice initiatives, it's typically only the state portion of funding that follows the student which tends to be about half, about $10,000 per student. So you're, you're not even getting the full amount um, to take to the Catholic school. So it saves taxpayer money. It gives families more, fo more choice relative to the status quo than they have today. And it's a basic concept of the money following the child. We, f we yeah. should fund students as opposed to systems. And we already do this. Democrats should be all on board with this. We do this with higher education, with Pell Grants. Yeah. Those are scholarships for kids to go to public universities that they want, but you don't, you aren't assigned to a university. They don't say you have to take it to the government run university. You can take it to a private, even religious university. If you want, yeah. you can think about Democrats support Head Start uh, pre-K programs. I think Michigan also has a pre-K program too, yeah. where you can take the scholarship to any private provider of pre-K you want. And you can also take it in Michigan to a religious private yeah. Uh, pre-k provider if you want yeah. and the democrats are totally supportive of those programs think about medicaid yeah. democrats love the Med medicaid program it's uh vouchers for hospitals basically do you have to take your voucher to a residentially assigned government-run hospital no you can even take it to a religiously affiliated catholic hospital if you want um with all of these initiatives democrats somehow understand that the beneficiaries are the families and they should have a choice in the, in the matter. Food stamps. Food stamps, you don't you don't have to spend it on government cheese at a residentially assigned <laughs> government grocery store. That would be horrible. Everybody would be against that. Republican, Democrat. Whether if we're going to spend the money, it should go to people 
And just like we have today with food stamps, you should be able to take it to Walmart if you want or Safeway or Trader Joe's or another provider of the service. That's how it works today. If we were assigned to government grocery stores, we'd probably get rotten expired food. And with the, uh, in the same way, we get a rotten education when families are, are assigned and compelled to take their taxpayer money to a government institution that fails them year after year with no incentive to spend additional dollars wisely. The better way to make things work, as we do in every other industry, is to allow people to choose so that they can hold schools accountable and have a rising tide that lifts all boats through competition. This has happened in other states in Florida. They were in the middle of the pack on the nation's report card a couple decades ago. Since they've expanded school choice, they're at the top of the pack when you control for different uh, demographics of students across states. Florida's at the top of the pack, yet despite they spend less than the national average per student, Florida's killing it as they've expanded school choice. In fact, the latest peer-reviewed evaluation of this kind of um, competitive response is by David Figlio in a top economics journal called the American Economic Journal. It's a top economics journal. And they find that when school choice expanded in Florida, the public schools upped their game in response to competition academically and even with uh, boosting attendance levels and having better behavioral outcomes in the public schools too. So this is a win-win solution. Uh, the only problem is, although Democrat voters and Republican voters alike support school choice generally, it's the Democratic Party that has basically become an arm of the teachers union because 99.9% .9 of the campaign contributions from the American Federation of Teachers, Randy Weingarten's union, go to the Democrats every single election cycle. It is basically a money laundering scheme. It ought to be illegal that they extort our money from us through the tax system, goes into the government school system, which then gets funneled to the teachers unions and then into the Democrat campaign coffers. That is the only reason we have uh, resistance to school choice is because of the special interest powers that be. They want to keep their gravy train going. But if we see it for what it is, if we apply logic to the scenario, that money's meant for the kids. It should follow them and their parents who know their kids more than bureaucrats sitting in offices hundreds of miles away. Those parents should have a say. They should be in the driver's seat and they should be the ultimate decision makers when it comes to the school that works best for their kid. And at the end of the day, if your public school is doing a fantastic job, as you claim, you should have nothing to worry about from yeah. a little competition. The families will continue sending their kids there because if it's a good school, look, it, it can be uh, painful to switch schools. And so if things are going okay, and even if they're basically the same as the private school, parents are going to continue sending their kids to the public school. So yeah. if you're in a good district, you should you should not be concerned about this uh, having a negative impact on your public school. Makes absolute sense. And you are taking the arrows. You are doing a great job of educating people. Um, and I know you're taking a lot of hits, but you keep pushing back. And I think people are learning a lot from you. The parent revolution. Uh, I'm going to have a link in the comments. And I just I really appreciate you taking the time because the more people that know about this, the more enlightened they will be. And I'm sure Michigan will hopefully be joining that revolution at some point. It's going to happen. The, the special interests can do all that they can to slow it down, but they won't stop it because parents are paying attention now. They've woken up. They're never going back to sleep. And the reality is for far too long in K-12 education, the only special interest represented the employees, yep. the adults in the system. But now, thankfully, the kids have a union of their own and they're called parents and they're paying attention and holding politicians accountable. So we will win the war that the unions have waged on families and their children for far too long. I'm optimistic going forward. We're seeing the laboratories of democracies working as intended, at least in red states. Hopefully the blue states will come along. Uh, but if not, maybe those blue states will swing back to become red states. Gotcha. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dave.